Hello, I'm Joy Lawrence. Welcome to my Shirley Jackson biography presentation. Shirley Jackson was born in 1916 and died in 1965. The sources that I used are biography.com, Encyclopedia Britannica, Opening Skinner's Box, Come Along With Me, and an interview that Jackson did with the San Francisco Chronicle. Shirley Jackson was born December 14, 1916 in San Francisco. This is a picture of her as a little girl with her brother and their dog. And this is her on the right with her uncle. I don't know who these two young girls are in the middle. She won a poetry prize at age 12, so that her writing style did gravitate more towards short stories later on, but at a young age, early on, she was writing poetry. In high school, she kept a diary not to keep track of events that happened, but to keep track of her writing progress. That was something she was very interested in developing. This is a picture of Shirley Jackson in her library at home. She was a commercially successful writer. What that means was that she made money at the craft. There's two kinds of success. There's commercial success where you are able to make a living at writing. And then there's the success of your peers respecting you and seeing your work as literary. Luckily for Shirley Jackson, she had both kinds of success. She attended the University of Rochester, but had a difficult time there and ended up moving back home in 1936. This is a picture of the University of Rochester and the roommate that she had when she was there. This is Shirley Jackson on the left. While she was at home, she didn't want to waste her time, so she gave herself the goal of writing a thousand words a day, and she met that goal. That is where she also met her future husband, Stanley Edgar Hyman. Here is Stanley Edgar Hyman on the far left on this photo. Shirley Jackson sitting here on the couch. There are three kids in front of them and one next to her. And here are their kids here as well. August 8, 1965, Shirley Jackson died of heart failure in her sleep. Every day she would take a nap and on this day she did not wake up. She was only 48 years old. At the time of her death, she was working on a book called Come Along With Me. Her husband finished editing the book that she was working on. He didn't finish writing it. So if you do get it, you'll be disappointed when, it's, when it ends before it ends. He wanted to round the book out a little more. So he included a lot of short stories that she wrote and some lectures that she did. If you like ghost stories, then that is a good book for you. Those are some creepy short stories and some of them are ghost stories. It's good. When her short story, The Lottery, came out, there was a lot of uproar. People didn't like it. They thought that this was a real ritual that was really happening in the world. And a lot of them were writing in to the local newspaper. What is this story? What is happening? We should find this city. We need to save these people. And even some who recognized that it was a short story were outraged by it. This, by the way, is a picture of her with her brother. Again, only this time as adults. So she did an interview in the San Francisco Chronicle. And she was explaining what her motivation was for doing this story. And here's one of the things that she says. She says, I suppose I hoped by setting a particularly brutal ancient rite in the present and in my own village to shock the story's readers with a graphic dramatization of the pointless violence and general inhumanity in their own lives. It's important to point out that this story was written in 1948, just three years after the liberation of Auschwitz. That is one of the largest concentration camps during the Holocaust. Now, the reason why that is significant is because this helps us understand the cultural context of what is going on at the time. Now, I know that I'm asking you to do a psychoanalytic analysis in this literary analysis for the lottery, but I want you to understand what is happening. And sometimes to understand the psychological implications, we have to know what is happening in the world. So Auschwitz and the Holocaust and World War II 
they, those molded the world and the culture of America. So here she is protesting totalitarianism, totalitarianism, which is what you had in World War II. Hitler was trying to be a totalitarian. And so this story is a protest of totalitarianism. Um, you, that idea that nothing is decided individually. The leader decides every single thing that happens. So you want to think about that in the lottery. It does kind of seem like they work together as a community, but are there people in charge who make things happen? Are there people who seem to be above any harm in the lottery? So how are the people manipulated into carrying on and submitting to the rule of that society? That is one of the things that she's pointing out. And again, she wanted to point out that potential in ordinary people to do evil things. Because after World War II ended and the Nazis were put on trial in the Nuremberg trials, one of the common refrains that we kept hearing over and over was, I was just doing my job. I didn't want to torture these people. I was only following orders. We were surprised by that the world and the country. Stanley Milgram was a social psychologist who wanted to really explore that idea of what will people do just because an authority figure told them to. So in 1970, he decided to conduct a study. This is the Mil known as the Milgram experiment. What they did was they had this layout. The experimenter sits here looking very official, wearing a lab coat, and the actor, who is the student, sits in this chair with a partition so that the teacher, the person off the street that they're experimenting on, cannot see the student, but they can see the experimenter. They say that they're doing a series of lists to um, see if things can be memorized, and each time the student, the actor, gets an answer wrong, the teacher, the person they're experimenting on, is supposed to administer a shock. They administer a heavier shock, increasing the voltage as the student keeps getting answers wrong. Eventually, the student, the actor, remember, is, starts screaming out in pain, begging for the teacher to stop. And by the way, the actor-student is not hooked up to any electrodes. This is all just an experiment to see what the teacher will do. The experimenters were talking before they started this, Milgram and his team, and they wondered how many people will actually do what we say, because who are we? We're just guys in white lab coats. They thought maybe 4%. They were surprised to find that 68% of the teachers went all the way to the end of the 450 volt scale. Many of them were willing to shock to the death because an experimenter was telling them to continue. Now, something that's interesting about this is they had several different forms of this study with different variables. The one where they kept telling the teachers, the experiment requires that you continue, please continue. When they use that kind of language, these are the results that they got. When they use language like, you have to continue, you have no choice, you have to do this almost every single person got up and walked away. So that's something interesting about humanity and about what it is to be human. There's something in us when we are told we have no choice that we get fired up and say, yes, we do have a choice. So that was something very interesting that they discovered in that experiment. And that is something that you will wanna think about when you are reading the lottery. What is it that's happening in that town? How are they keeping the teachers in check? Think about the men who run the town are also the men who run the lottery. Those men who run the lottery, pay attention to who holds the black box and who does things with the black box. Those are the men who run the lottery. What position do they also hold in the town? Would it be dangerous for people to cross them? You should think about that psychoanalytic criticism. I hope that I've given you something helpful to use when you do that literary analysis. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.